want to welcome everyone to our first event of the day. Uh, my name is Jennifer Entwistle, and I'm the co-director of the Newburyport Literary Festival. This is our 16th year of bringing authors and readers together, and it is our biggest year yet with over 100 participants. So um, I hope you've gone through the schedule. We've got two full days with something for everyone. So if you haven't registered for your events for today and tomorrow, check out the schedule and I'm sure you will find something to watch. So we are using Zoom webinar, and that means that you can see the panelists, but we cannot see or hear the audience. So we invite you to use the chat if you want to have any sort of discussion. But if you have questions for the author, please use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, so they will be taking questions later on in the session. Um, I also want to thank A Mighty Blaze for partnering with us again this year. We are live streaming to their Facebook page right now. So thank you, Blaze, for joining us again this year. And uh, last in my housekeeping, I want to remind you that local bookstores need our support now more than ever. Um, we hope you'll consider buying your books from our two partner booksellers, Jabberwocky Bookshop in Newburyport and the Bookshop of Beverly Farms. Uh, so once we get started, I will put links in the chat to those two booksellers. Of course, if you have a favorite independent bookseller, then I encourage you to buy your books there as well. So let's get started with the address book. We <laughs> have got our <laughs> moderator today is my friend, Emily Fine. She is the producer and co-host of the podcast, The Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read, um, <laughs> along with her friend and fellow book lover, Chris Wolak. And if you're not familiar with this podcast, I highly recommend that you go download it. It's wonderful. Um, but you will fill your TBR up right away. <laughs> when she's not podcasting or embarking on literary adventures, she spends her time as a philanthropist Anthropic consultant and grant writer. She is joining us from her home in Connecticut. And with us is our author, Deirdre Mask, who graduated <laughs> from Harvard College summa cum laude and attended Oxford University before returning to Harvard for law school, where she was an editor of the Harvard Law Review. She has a master's in writing from the National University of Ireland. She's originally from North Carolina, but she lives in London with her husband and her daughters. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. This is delightful. I'm so glad I can be here even in Zoom. So it's fantastic. Yeah, Deirdre, it's so funny. I was thinking about how your book takes us to so many parts of the world. Yes. So it somehow seems appropriate that we're participating in a literary festival in Massachusetts and you're in London and I'm in Connecticut. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's actually so funny. My book came out a couple of days after bookstores shut here in London, which is an absolute felt like an absolute disaster. But actually, in some ways, it opened the world to me. So, um, so I actually, it's actually a pleasure to do these now. Yeah, there's been one good part in that is yes. that we can festivals and do things, you know, worldwide. So I'm exactly to be here with you today. Thank you. you. This book was such a pleasant surprise for me. It's not <laughs> academic at all. It's no. very friendly to read. And you really tell the story of location through mm. story, mm. details, scent. It's just lovely. And I thought you could start by telling people the story of walking to your post office when you were yes. living in Ireland with yes. your dad's birthday card. Yes. To drop it in the mail to North Carolina. And then somehow, from that, this was born. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's weird because um, from Jen's wonderful introduction, nothing in my background would have led me to think I would write a book about addresses. But I had exactly that experience that I was living in Ireland. I sent my dad a birthday card. And you have one of those moments where you're like, how do they split the money between the stamp that I bought in Ireland and, you know, the, the, the postal service in America has to deliver it. Like, how do they do that? So, of course, in a moment of procrastination, I start Googling around and I find the Universal Postal Union, which I always say is a, is a, it's a second um, oldest uh, UN organization and organizes the world's mail. I feel like they purposely named it something incredibly boring to conceal how incredibly interesting it is managing the world's <laughs> mail. But on their website, I found this incredible 
program they were coming up with, uh, which was called uh, Addressing the World, an Address for Everyone. And I clicked on it and I read basically that one of their huge projects is to give everybody in the world an address, that there are billions of people around the world that don't have addresses. And it seemed like this kind of odd thing because I'd always taken it for granted that I had an address. And then I looked into it more. I saw that there were even parts of the United States that didn't have addresses um, and parts of the United States not too far from where I was from in North Carolina. So I became fascinated by this. And when next time I went home to North Carolina, I borrowed my dad's car and I drove to West Virginia. And I ended up writing an article for The Atlantic about a project in West Virginia that was designed to name, um, to, to give street addresses to people in very rural, um, very poor, you know, one of the very poorest counties in America, um, street addresses. And I sort of uh, ended up launching from there. Um, I got letters from all over the world about people about their street addresses. And I realized there was so much more to it than, than, um, than I thought it was. Yeah, I love the portion when you go to rural Virginia, yeah. you know, there, there's a, a process in place where they're trying to, or the, I should say they're starting a process to yeah. name these streets. And some of the citizens there are not having it. I mean, no. they, they do not. And I grew up in a small town yeah. where, you know, you go, oh, you go down to the Tasty Freeze and you take mm -hmm. a left exactly. and then you go right at Susie's house. <laughs> and, you know, you don't know the street names. And these no. really were affronted by this idea of. Yeah, you know, right? exactly. And these are tiny communities. I mean, I think I think the biggest uh, city in this county is about 2000 people. So these are mostly 200, 300, 400 people. And I mean, the way they give directions is poetry, you know, they give them in paragraphs past the old sewing factory, you know, in one place, they would pivot directions around the old Bartley school, which had burned down like many years before, you know, it's a dumpster pit, like a cow, the drive in movie theater. I mean, there was something really beautiful about it. Um, but yeah, they need addresses. Mostly this is sort of a 911 function. I would I spoke to an ambulance driver who told me that they would play a game of you know like colder hotter like you play when you're a kid you know can you hear the sirens are they getting closer you know am I getting hotter you know winding their way through these lanes but yes your point you make is exactly right there are lots of people who, who didn't like this process who didn't want street names and I would talk to some of the addressing coordinators about this they would say oh you know they're just ticks you know these are just ignorant people who don't really know what's going on I was like, oh, cool. I didn't know. But the more I read about the history of addresses, the more I realized that these were the smartest people in town because they completely understood that addresses are not just about being able to find you in a case of emergency. The addresses were really created by the state and they were not created to help you find your way around, even though they're very good for that, or get your mail, even though they're also excellent for that. They were intended to find you, right? To tax you, to imprison you, to police you, to draft you, to quarter soldiers in your home. The state needed to find people in order to do the things they wanted to do with them. And, and so, so I actually, and, and this was why when addresses were sort of invented or, or became popular in the 18th century, why people rebelled, you know, then as well, and um, in, in pretty violent and vigorous ways. So interestingly, these people who were considered ignorance and hicks, I thought were probably the most enlightened people in, in the entire county about what was actually going on. Right, maybe they didn't want to be found. Exactly, exactly. there are very good reasons not to want to be found, right. exactly. So, so um, then you take us to the streets of Kolkata, yeah, because there's also, you know, there there are way there are people living in places that make it really difficult to figure out how to give them addresses or have homes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Your experience? Yeah. Exactly. So I decided to look a bit at addresslessness around the world. And I came across a project that was in Kolkata in the slums of Kolkata uh, to give them addresses. And it seemed like a very odd nonprofit because out of all the things you would think the slums in Kolkata needed, an address would not necessarily be one of them. But actually, addresses are incredibly useful in so many ways, which is why the UPU pushes them. It's a big project of the World Bank as well for lifting people out of poverty because you can't get a bank account without an address. You can't get credit. You can't get private mail. Um, you know, it's hard to do things like register your children for school or get a birth certificate or get married or get identification cards, get a passport. Almost anything you can think of in this world requires an address. And so, you know, this project had linked up giving addresses alongside um, linking people with bank accounts. Um, and there's also a civic community idea as well. Like you become um, somebody who can be found by outsiders. Like, you know, you can kind of know your neighbors, but if you want somebody outside your neighborhood to help you, and almost everybody who can help you is outside your neighborhood, they need to be able to find you. 
so yeah, so I went to Calcutta to see to see uh, to see how the project was going, and it was you know entirely fascinating that people really wanted these addresses and they wanted the the inclusion aspect of it as well, and it linked into a long history in India of um, colonialism, of when you know you had the British areas and you had the the Indian slums, and also about the nature of slums themselves, which are almost by definition most of them are illegitimate, and and the state not wanting to legitimize these uh, these slums by giving them addresses. Right, right. And then the other thing that happens when people all live close together, yeah. there are problems with disease. Yeah. So as if you you were kind of foretelling, I, I know. It was really <laughs> interesting because in chapter two, is it starts by the heading is um, disease. Let me find it real quick. It's yeah, the, where you're talking about cholera, right? Yes. The exactly. Title of chapter two is "Could Street Addresses Stop an Epidemic?" Exactly. Yeah. No, I, I felt very. Uh, you know, I felt like a soothsayer bit in writing this chapter. Though to be honest, this is what epidemiologists have talked about forever. So I was really just sort of getting into it late in the game myself. Yeah. So there's this idea. So this chapter starts off in Victorian London, and you have this um, disease detective, this early epidemiologist. He was also an anesthesiologist, very early anesthesiologist. He gave um, he gave anesthesia, for example, to Queen Victoria during her her last two labors. Um, but you know, you have this man in Victorian London who's obsessed with cholera. Where's cholera coming from? You know, cholera was just there's just waves of cholera throughout London, and he happened to live quite close to, um, you know, basically a, a slum, that a Broad Street slum that had had an outbreak of cholera, and he's able to track down um, using. Uh, death certificates and also interviews with doctors and other people. He's, he's able to, to track down people who died of cholera. And this makes a long story short, but he's able to trace the cholera to a certain pump where people were getting water. Um, at the time, people didn't really know cholera was spread through water. They thought it was, you know, they didn't really have a germ theory of disease. Anyway, so he's able to do it. Long story short, they turned the, the pump more complicated than that, but they, they're able to track down the epidemic. But interestingly, if you fast forward to the, to the Haiti earthquake, right after the Haiti earthquake, the, you know, massive um, earthquake in, was it 2010? Um, and there's a huge cholera outbreak in Haiti. You know, he had never seen cholera before. Um, and basically what Jon Snow had been able to do in Victorian London was basically impossible in Haiti because there just are no addresses. And, and in fact, in love Haiti, there's no proper mapping at all. So I sort of tell the story of, um, of people, mostly uh, doctors without borders and also an epidemiologist who came from France to try to track the cholera, to try to figure out, you know, how do you figure out where the cholera in Haiti was coming from? And as many of you will know, it ended up actually having been imported by the UN. Um, and, and, and it was the process of trying to track it down. So um, that, that's, that chapter also tells of how people are trying to map in advance of crises, um, you know, as we now know how important it is, you know, tracking and tracing uh, during a during an epidemic. Yeah, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm yeah. wondering if you if you've paid. Well, I mean, obviously we're all paying yeah. attention to what's happening with the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Did anything you learn come to prove true? Oh yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I think it's still. I mean, I think there's going to be so many people thinking about this and writing about this later. But shortly after the pandemic, I ended up writing an article for the Financial Times that was sort of talking about exactly this. And I was looking at the time at Singapore which has a, you know, as everybody knows, it's a fairly surveillance state. And they were, I haven't watched them in a while, they were extremely good at the start of doing all the things that places like the UK, where I live in the US, failed to do. Finding people, right? They could find people, they could track you at the airport, they would turn up at the door. Um, they, their quarantine orders were very strict. They were able to surveil. And it, and it kind of, in a way, proved this thesis about the, the connection between location and disease, being able to find people. But interestingly, whenever they had flare-ups of, um, of COVID at the time, they were usually in these migrant communities because Singapore is staffed you know, by huge migrant populations and people were living in these migrant dormitories where it is harder to keep track of people, right? It's harder to find them. They aren't they aren't people who are generally known, you know, they're sort of, you know, faceless, the faceless help in a way. And so I really thought that this was kind of interesting and also telling that story of the people we choose to count and the people we don't choose to pay attention to. And I was telling this to my husband, who's a, who's a, a law professor, and he said that it reminded him of something um, that, that he's read in a legal case, which is uh, when you look into a crowded room, you only see your friends. <laughs> And I, and I kind of thought in a, in a way this was a bit like this about that we count and we track people that we could see that are our friends and how hard it is for us to keep track of these people that we sort of treat like pennies in a jar, sort of nameless, faceless uh, people. And I thought that in some ways this had shown, uh, shown true in Singapore. 
Yeah, I mean, it's also interesting because people, you also have to just factor in human behavior. Yeah. People decide to do things that are surprising, you know? Yeah. You know, you think like, oh, you're quarantined, you're locked down, you're not going to go anywhere. But then people decide to meet up with a friend and have a night together. And then exactly, exactly. And some of it's, and some of it's, you know, know and knowledge. And some people just don't truly just don't understand. And and sometimes we don't understand. There's a, there's a study that's really powerful. that I always wanted to write about that was about, um, government's trying to track people through cell phone use, which sounded really clever, but they were trying to track through cell phone use in places where people use cell phones very differently than we use them. They have more than one cell phone. They borrow them or they rent them or they loan them out. They have one for business. They have one for pleasure. They, they, they use cell phones entirely differently. So the data was entirely wrong because that person wasn't you. It was the person who was renting your cell phone for the day or the person who was doing this. So we have, we, you know, it's, it's a lot harder than it looks um, keeping track of people. Again, as we've now learned to our detriment. Right. Well, I wanted to um, read a portion to you. If that's yeah, okay. you of know, course. That's, that's kind of funny, but yeah. um, there's two reasons I want to read this. One is I want people to be able to see that they're really neat pictures, <laughs> Yeah, you know? And I also just want folks to get a sense of how, how you tell story. Okay. So I'm going to start with a, with a few sentences, and then I'd love it if you tell the story of Maria Teresa. Yeah. So in 1740, during one of the coldest and wettest Octobers in memory, Charles VI, the Holy Roman Emperor, went hunting. He soon fell seriously ill and died, perhaps from eating a meal of poisonous mushrooms. Note to self, always exactly. 23-year-old <laughs> Maria Theresa, his oldest daughter, was suddenly the Empress of the Habsburg Empire. Her parents had still thought they might have a son, and they had educated her mostly in courtly deportment like dancing and music. A Prussian emissary in 1746 described her heaps of pale blonde hair, round face, small nose that was neither curved nor turned upwards, large mouth, well-formed neck and throat. Her figure, he wrote, was by then ruined by childbirth. Maria Theresa would give birth to 16 children in 19 years, but her arms and hands were wonderful. Exactly. <laughs> introduction to Teresa, yes exactly uh who i grew very fond of i mean she's a formidable woman and she had many terrible qualities including just a huge anti you know huge anti-semite but she, she 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 did something kind of powerful that relates to the story and to house numbering in particular this is a chapter on house numbers so basically you have maria Teresa, who's you know just this formidable leader she has these 16 children she's fighting all of these wars on all sides and and one of her problems is that she needs more soldiers and so but the problem then is that, you know, basically the theory of government then was that you have this leader and you have this territory and like as long as they don't kill you and as long as they like give their money, you, you don't really mess around with what's going on locally. You kind of leave it to the local aristocrats, but that local aristocrats don't really have any incentive to help you out necessarily. So they want the, the strong men to stay and work the fields and work there. Why, why do they want to give them to you? So she does this project of house numbering. There's this brilliant Viennese academic, Anton Tanner, who sort of led me through this tale. But she, she goes through and they have they make this ink made out of boiled bones and some other stuff, and they paint it on the doors. And people go crazy because they realize exactly what those West Virginians realized, that people were going, that, that they could now be identified, you know, that, that their, their anonymity was being stripped. Because now anybody could see where they lived, and, and so they basically ended up taking a very complicated census um, of drafting of drafting soldiers. And this led, you know, this was just one of many stories of house numbering that happened in Europe around this time, often for these very purposes to, to draft soldiers, to quarter soldiers was another one for taxation. Um, you know, uh, sometimes directory publishers also did it to sell. They wouldn't sell your information in a, in a directory publisher, so they would take it upon themselves to um, give house numbers. This was a way a lot of, of house numbers happened in the US as well. Um, but her story is basically a story of power. Um, you know, how, how finding people and categorizing people, you know, sort of reflects sort of this shift in the modern state. Yeah. yeah. And um, we have a question that I want to get. Yeah. To, I, I don't want to forget to look at questions. Yes. <laughs> this is actually from author Meg Moore. Thank you, Meg. Right. This is a perfect segue. Thank you. Yeah. This chapter on homelessness. Meg said she yeah. was touched by that. And I have to tell you that this was a really interesting experience for me because I read both read the book and yeah. listened to the audio. Oh, lovely. Well, it, with the audio book is great. For it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And I was pulling out of my favorite bagel shop in New Haven and started yeah. chapter 14 that says, like Manhattan, 
New Haven. Is- <laughs> what? Yes. <laughs> so can you yes. talk about what you learned about homelessness? Yeah, exactly. Well, there's two different ways of addresslessness, right? Like there's what we talked about in Calcutta, where there's mm-hmm. just systematically no addresses. But then actually what is, is, is just as hard is living without an address in an addressed world. So, you know, the chapter on homelessness, I sort of thought, okay, I should do this. But that tended to be actually one of the more meaningful chapters for me as well. And it starts with a, a Yale law student uh, who is doing... Uh, she wants to write something about homelessness. And she does what we should all do and people don't think to do is just ask people who are homeless, what is it you need? And of course people needed homes. I mean, of course they needed all sorts of things, but what they said again and again to her that they needed an address. And so she looked into this more and 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 what she needed, they what they needed was some way of passing as not being homeless. Um, so for example, when you get a job, people just, you know, and she interviewed employers who admitted they discriminate against the homeless. And they even would discriminate against people who put down the homeless shelter's address because they know them, right? Um, you know, in, in order to do other any other function to, you know, register with a doctor, to um, to get cards, bank accounts, vote, all these things are made incredibly uh incredibly easier with an address. Um, so you really need a way of passing. And, and this taps into all of this research about how um, how den- how low pe- we see the homeless. So for example, there are neurologists who have, who have you know, shown pictures of different things while people are on MRIs that have shown that we see homeless people as less than human, that we, we equate them in our minds. So, so people really need to pretend that they aren't homeless in order to not be homeless. Um, so, so, there's, so there's a chapter tracks all these different ways that all these innovators are trying to give homeless people addresses basically as a way of ultimately getting them a real address, which is their home. Right, and I thought it was really fascinating. Um, I can't remember his name. Yeah. Maybe it was Chris Hildry? Was that Chris Hildry, he's the English yeah. architect. And, yeah. Well, why don't we let people have the names of homes where, that are unoccupied? Yeah, it's he's doing it. He's actually doing this as an architect and designer. Um, he's actually kind of, he's quite young. He's actually kind of a big time designer. He just redesigned the um, National the Museum of History here in London. Um, but he just basically came up with this idea that he just didn't want to build a better tent. He wanted to restructure something. And he's basically teamed up with the Royal Mail and the council to give homeless people the addresses of empty homes to use. So they don't, there's nothing to do with the actual home. It's, it's like mail forwarding. It's like if I moved and I had my mail forwarded, I'm using my old address, while the new people who lived here would be also using the address. It doesn't matter how many people are really using that address, you know, the way this, the mail systems are set up. So what, what happened is that that person who, need, you know, who needs an address um, gets one and they can forward it to anywhere they want. They could forward it to the homeless shelter they're staying at or to a friend or to their work or something like that. But they would have something that looked like a permanent address. And he did this with empty homes, but actually you could do it with your own home. Nobody owns their own address, but people are uncomfortable with that because they don't understand that that doesn't mean giving them property right. Um, but yeah, no, he's trialing at the minute. So um, so I'm hoping it really hoping it works out. Do you know if it's, if, if it's having some success? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's just having some success. And I think a lot of it was the public relations fight as well, you know, getting people on board. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's early days. But, um, but you know, they figured out the system of how to actually make this work. So, so hopefully. I- a vicious circle of if you yeah. don't have an address you can't get a job right yes exactly job, and it's harder to get out of you know your situation being homeless so. exactly so it's, it's something i read i read a lot of a lot of research about um uh, people who, who are working to fight homelessness and, and they were basically making this point that people often say you know why don't homeless people take up these services there's all these services and it's empty and the funny thing is you kind of have to pretend that you aren't homeless to, to not be homeless so once you've admitted you're homeless and and you sometimes take advantage of some of the services sometimes that actually ironically makes it harder for you to get out of homelessness because you 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 have sometimes there's all sorts of theories about this but sometimes you have the frame of mind of oh i am homeless rather than this being some temporary condition so this is why people work really hard to pass as not homeless by, you know, you know, you know, washing up in gas station bathrooms and couch surfing and, you know, going over the, you know, out of their way to make sure they're clean and tidy and presentable. Um, because these are, that that is really the way uh, that people get out of homelessness. So, um, so this, but an address is something that you can't fake. Um, and so this is, this is, you know, the, the chapter tells of different ways of, of going about doing this. Right, right. So we have another question, and yeah. this, this was a question I was going to ask also. Thank you, Alicia. Great. <laughs> Alicia says, I love how this book went to so many different countries with different yeah. ways of addressing homes. Tokyo was very interesting. Yeah. 
Were there any other cities you looked at or studied that had interesting or unique ways of addressing that maybe missed mention? Oh, oh gosh, let me think. Um, you know, one that mismentioned in the book a bit, well, first of all, there's some that are like totally crazy. I, I mentioned Venice, but Venice is totally mad. But as I also say in the book, like Venice could do whatever it wants. So I didn't really, you know, we don't even care what Venice does. Like Venice is just going to be Venice and we're going to love it for it. One place I didn't talk about as much, I talk about Ireland in the book quite a bit, but Ireland has a, sort of a unique addressing system. They have this ancient system of townlands, um, you know, which are these very small, um, plots of land. I mean, sometimes they're, I mean, they're just a few acres and, and people really know the location of places by townlands and they aren't necessarily on a map. Um, but you kind of know them. And actually, I was just listening to the podcast, West Cork, if anybody had heard, where they start talking about townlands and how there's no street names or, or house numbers in these parts of rural Ireland. And they're really ancient and they often have ancient uh, Irish names. So my, my husband's from Ireland, uh, from Northern Ireland, and his townland is Tulk, which means hill. Um, but the interesting thing about townlands uh, is that in Northern Ireland, which I talk about in the book, you know, you have the, the you know, I guess it's a, a war basically between uh, the troubles between the Protestants and the Catholics. They actually both agree on really liking townlands and they actually united to try to get the Royal Mail to require them or to, to put a line for townland on the, the address form. Partly because I think the theory is, you know, the one of the reasons they fight is that they love the land so much. And these townland names, these ancient lane, names are so connected with the land that it's actually something that they can that, that they can both agree on, uh, these townland names. Um, so, so in parts of Ireland, you'll, you'll, you won't won't hear people talk about um, street names and house numbers as much as these very small distinctive plots of land that sort of incorporate a very tiny community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering too if you're just in the editing process if there were yeah. stories that you that were really close to your heart but that just didn't make it. Oh. Oh, there's so many. I mean, one, I ended up writing a short piece about it uh, for the history reader. Um, but one that was about street names as revenge, as diplomatic revenge. This is a big thing around the world, using street names to get revenge against another country. So this is, DC is huge on this. Um, you know, there are lots of little plazas named after like, um, say, say the plaza in front of the Russian embassy is named after a Russian dissident that was killed by the government. Um, and, then, and, then, and then, you know, some other state, you know, there's like Ho Chi Minh, is that is in front of the American embassy in India, or it might be getting this one of the American embassies in India. There's this, they, they constantly are going back and forth with street names. And there's this great story, which I'll tell very quickly, which is about New York, actually. Uh, you know, the book sort of opens with New York uh, about these, all these commemorative names. And one of these commemorative names was actually named after uh, in a woman in Nigeria who was, who was the wife of, a, of um, the president elect in Nigeria, who was then imprisoned and then actually died, actually, weirdly, when the diplomatic mission, US diplomatic mission, was visiting. So Susan. Rice was there when he died. It's very odd. But um, but uh, she was killed and they put up a commemorative sign in New York right in front of the Nigerian embassy with her name on it. And the Nigerian government was so upset about this, they sued they go to the New York Supreme Court, they sue, they lose. Um, they, they hire people to come to the street naming festivities to, to chant against it. And they end up renaming the street in front of the, um, the, the American embassy in Nigeria um, after Louis Farrakhan, Louis Farrakhan, which is kind of an odd choice. Now, this was this is before Nigeria now has a, you know, is, is, is this, this was when it was a military dictatorship. But it, it was emblematic of one of the ways that people use street names as sort of power tools. Um, and, it, and it still happens. In fact, DC Republicans had, had wanted to name, um, you know, streets in, in, in DC after Chinese dissidents. Uh, this was only recently has come up as well. So, um, so yeah, so street names is diplomatic revenge that definitely got left out. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, well, your, your statistic at the beginning of the book about how much time is spent in New York court, yeah. you know, trying yeah. to get streets renamed was shocking. <laughs> exactly. I mean, some of it's historic. They don't do it quite as much as they do, but they did actually. I mean, they did over a hundred streets in 2018, which I think is when I was researching for the book. Yeah. Then some years there were almost 40% um, of city council laws in New York were about street names. The way they've changed it now, the reason it doesn't happen that way now is now they tend to consolidate it into one bill. So before, I think it was all these little piecemeal bills, which is why there were so many of them. But yeah, it was a huge thing in New York. They try to cut back. They change. I think every year they, they do do a, a few fewer. But um, but yeah, but New York, even though the grid has been there, you know, for hundreds of years, even though, uh, you know, it's largely a numbered street system, um, those commemorative street names still keep coming up in, in New York. 
And also, since we're in New York, can you talk yeah. about the concept of vanity addresses? I have yeah. heard of this. Yes. I mean, this was one of the early things I actually started researching because I was so fascinated by this. And in New York, there's a project um, called Vanity Addresses, uh, where you can request from the city, it's usually from your the borough, uh, the borough mayor, is that the name? Borough mayor, um, to have an address for your building that's not actually the actual address. So it all it almost always comes up because you want a posture address. So you you want to be on Park Avenue. Um, so you're able, you can pay like eleven thousand dollars, it's not that much, um, to petition to get your street named uh Park Avenue, even though your building isn't actually on Park Avenue. They do this a lot, lot less frequently than they used to, though they still do. Um, they still do. But so, so, so New York is just absolutely littered with buildings that have names on them and numbers as well, because maybe you want to be number one names and numbers that don't actually correspond to where they should actually be on the map. Um, David Dinkins, I think it was, it was a big proponent of these in a time when the city's development was in decline. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, no, but it still happens today. Well, that was fascinating to me. And I thought, boy, that must be really confusing for the people who have to Address incredibly confusing and, yeah yeah it must be incredibly confusing i mean i i, I can't I, i'm baffled that this was allowed to happen and, and i think every time i spoke to somebody about it they were always been cheapish about it you know i think i think people know this was a terrible idea but but most of these buildings have been addressed for for many years now so i think there's probably no going back at least for the ones already uh who are already taking advantage of it right right so you touched on the subject of research there's over yeah. 50, almost 50 pages of notes in this yeah <laughs> Can you talk about your research? Yeah, I love the research part. It probably comes up. Um, yeah, because I think I kind of didn't realize it, but I kind of felt like in this book, I was all of a sudden giving a history of the entire world over many different eras. And I was really conscious about getting it right. So yeah, so I spent a lot of time traveling when you could do that. Uh, so I went to many of the places in the chapters like India and Vienna and St. Louis, Missouri. And um, I spent a lot of, in Ireland and spent a lot of time in all these places, but it was really me and the old British library, uh, which for people who don't know is kind of the equivalent of library of Congress here. Um, you know, it's a free, you know, sort of a library of record. And it was so funny because often I'd be working on several chapters at once and I got to, I would get to know the people who work there and they they could never work out what I was doing because I'd have a chapter on um Korean script you know a chapter you know I'd, I'd have a book on Korean script a book on ancient Rome you know a, a homelessness guide to London uh, I got to have all these different things and I always remember thinking they just must think I'm just this crazy lady who just comes and checks out you know these five or six books and sits in the progress but yeah a lot of it was that. also I mean there are I mean if people who are interested in this topic, I mean, there are just academics who are doing really brilliant work on addressing and names. And um, I spoke to I spoke to many of them. Um, the thing is, they just they're academics and they write in a very academic style. So part of my goals for this book was to enliven a lot of their research, and, and many of those names are, are are in the notes. So yeah, so I did a lot of interviewing, and it's amazing how much you can just sort of. I'd be I'd be writing about a South African legal case, and I'd see the lawyer's name, and I was like, hmm, what if I called him up? And you call them up, and people are very happy to talk to you. So I did a lot of that, like, well, what's the what's the country code for South Africa? Okay, and then I would just tell them about people, and so so people were very um, very open to talking about it. And people, for some reason, it was often a topic that sort of hit a nerve with people. People felt very passionately about their addresses. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. So, um, did it from the from the time you wrote that article to yeah. when? Yeah, you had a finished book. How many yeah. years? Did you oh, have? it must have been four. I must have been four years. I, I always say I took four years to write the book. Though it's a bit misleading because I had two kids in that. So, you know, some of it was, some of it obviously I really wasn't working that much, but it took me a really long time. Um, to write it, mostly because there is so much research in it, and I wanted to compile. It. I really wanted it to be accurate, you know. So I, not only writing it, but then fact checking it, and then getting other experts to read it and make sure that you know there wasn't anything I was missing or I wasn't mis being misleading, and that I understood. You know, often I would have to understand something enough to to try to convey it, and that took me a really long time. So um, there was a lot of other stuff going on in my life, but I'd say probably about four years from when, at least from at least when I got the book contract to to when it was actually published. So speaking about tricky concepts, mm. you talk a lot about mapping yeah. and place and very different ways that people are choosing to try to, you know, map and, lo and, and put locations on maps, but not in the ways that we are typically used to seeing. Yeah. 
Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, one of the, you know, so actually addressing streets is actually really complicated. I mean, who knew? But, you know, like but giving streets names, is really controversial and giving house numbers is really controversial. So a lot of places are thinking, look, we can do this better. Um, so there are companies, one of the ones I profiled is, is this English company that's doing extremely well. Uh, it's called What Three Words. And they basically mapped the entire world, the three meter by three meter squares and given them a name that's actually three words. Um, and the reason they give words rather than numbers is that a string of numbers is just harder to remember. Um, so, you know, I'm, you know, where I am might be, I'm looking at my room, basket, lamp, uh, bookcase. And, and then and then you could type that into their app and it zeroes in not just on on our, my flat where I'm, I'm speaking from but from the very you know basically the very spot that I am so it's actually really useful also for places that don't have addresses like um, a park or the side of a road you know you can really indicate with a lot of specificity um, th and then there are many other people doing this um, companies doing this Google has really gotten in their game the Google the the, the Google Maps um, sort of pin codes what do they call them plus codes are extremely good and those are actually open data. And I mentioned the open data because what three words is a startup company. They want to make money off of this. So, so to do anything with it, you have to go into their app. Um, and it also creates this kind of weird world where like your, your address doesn't link to your neighbors in any way, you know, like your address, it, it, like there's no cohesive sense of community about it. Um, but it is very good at the very specific job of getting something, you know, if you want to pack it to your back door rather than your front door, you could give them a different address because it's a different place. Um, but I guess maybe after writing the whole book on addresses, there's something that left me a bit uncomfortable about this, even though a lot of the book is about how we need addresses, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I'm not sure what part made you uncomfortable. You mean the yeah. fact that you locate at anything, anywhere? No, or? that didn't make you uncomfortable so much. I guess it was just moving away from this like community-based, um, you know, a lot of a lot of the book, which we haven't talked about as much, is about arguments over street names, right? Like people debating Confederate street names or people debating street names in South Africa or in post-war Berlin and all these other places. And there's something that there's a lot of meaning, there's a lot of value you can get from those debates. And I say in the book that like, you know, a lot of people say, you know, these arguments just divide these communities when you have an argument over a Confederate street name. Well, I think they kind of make the communities. I think this process of trying to figure out who to commemorate and what to do, you know, all of these even commemorative street names in New York, I think it's, it's a valuable part of our community building. So I think there's just something that we've just sold so much of our of our public resources to the, you know, to the private sector, people talk about all the time, you know, we used to have the you know, the man standing in front of the AMP preaching, but now we've got somebody on Facebook or Instagram that they, they've taken all of our all of our public spaces. So I guess I'm, I'm really reluctant to have an, yet another startup take away this amazing public good of addresses and, and the benefits that they have, even, even if I recognize that they are really useful for what they're intended to do. Right. Well, it's funny because when I was reading that part of the book, I was thinking about both my kids played soccer and they, were, yeah. they played, they weren't always in school. They were playing, you know, um, outside of school and they would have we'd have to find some esoteric soccer oh, field in the middle it's of a nightmare <laughs> and this was before gps i my kids yes you know? yes and and so i was always really proud of myself because i would get out a map and i would look at a map and i would go find <laughs> place, you know and drive yes but yes but you talk about the effect of gps on the hippocampus and yeah flabby hippocampus so I thought, yes you're flabby how can you i mean that's just yet another part of your body that can't be flabby apparently is your <laughs> campus yeah I interviewed all these the neuroscientists and it really, that was one nice thing about being in london um you know the leaders in this field uh that, that it was really discovered this connection between um place and, and memory that's located in this part of your brain called the hippocampus um that basically you know there's something called there's certain neurons that start to to um that govern sort of how you get around um you know how you know how you assess distance how you navigate all of these things are located in this part of your brain interestingly that also is the part of the brain that they think is responsible for memory which is why place and memory are really connected and why so many of our memories are are also very place-based um but yeah this idea they can get flabby was that there are researchers in these labs in london uh who who were doing all these studies that were basically trying to was basically showing that when we just rely on gps and not on the landmarks and the physical atmosphere you know that 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 we can get we can lose these abilities that, that sort of dulls our ability to do it and you know i say it in a much more more complicated language but that's that's the fear that that the gps is some somehow dulling this and and you know 
And it wouldn't be that big a deal because GPS isn't going anywhere, except that it's also related to this part of the brain that deals with memory. So is there something, you know, it's a question, is there something we're losing if we're, if we're not using this part of, the, of our brain um, in the same ways that we used to? Yeah, yeah, I found that really fascinating. We have a couple more questions. Yeah, of course. Um, from Catherine, was it difficult yeah. to convince a publisher about the interest in your book? Catherine, that's like the nicest question anybody's ever asked because it was so hard. <laughs> so thank you so much for asking that. Yes, no, it was really hard. I was I was really lucky to have an agent who was really, really into the idea. Um, and I'd gotten a lot of feedback, uh, you know, great feedback about it. But I, I, you know, you send it out for those of you guys who are authors, you know, this game, you know, you send it out to different editors and one by one, the editors will come back like either they, you know, the, the idea is cool, but like, who's going to read a book about addresses? You know, who's going to, or some people also, uh, for those of you who read the book, it's a a bit um it deals a lot of heavy things but it's not a heavy book you know it's quite I try to say it strikes a friendly tone and there were other publishers who really didn't like that they really thought it should be like if it was going to be this kind of book it should be like a really serious kind of book and that's just not the way that I wanted to convey this message so I was lucky that one St. Martin's Press which is who publishes my book in the in the U.S. um and profile books here in the UK, they just were really into it, and they kind of gave me, you know, free reign to kind of do what I wanted. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it, it seems to have struck a nerve with a lot of people. So I always thought people could be really interested in addresses. But yes, Catherine, thank you for asking that. No, because publishers were, were by and large, completely perplexed that anybody would ever read this book. So. <laughs> well, kudos to St. Martin's. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> And then Linda has a question. Has there been an impact on residents in Trump Tower having yeah. to have that as an address? Yes, I've been following that a bit. Yeah, I mean, I know there have been some of his buildings, the residents have been trying to get this, the, the buildings renamed, um, but I haven't actually followed how successful they've been at that. Um, interestingly, there's now a Trump Street, I believe in France, which is a dead end. It's named <laughs> purpose, so I thought that was kind of funny. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, Trump plays, uh, you know, for those of you who read the book, plays a role in the book because he he would do this, you know, this re he, he knows, I mean, what does he know better than branding and rebadging and, and, and lying, right? So, so which is really what a vanity address is. So, you know, so one of the stories tells about one of his buildings where he, I'm not sure if he formally used the vanity address system or whether he just convinced the city um, to change the address, but they, they, they changed the address of one of his buildings to sound, to sound posher, right? In Central Park West, rather than Columbus Circle, which at least then wasn't, um, wasn't such a posh name. So yeah, so I mean, I don't know how, how successful they've been, but um, but this idea of manipulating names, um, you know, is, is one that, that, that he'd be very familiar with. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry to have to pop back. No, that, not like that. that It means that we have to wrap up because yes. this conversation has been so fascinating. Oh, I thank you. Catherine's question about trying to sell the book, I was thinking, I can imagine it would be hard. And yet, yeah. what an amazing topic. Oh, I thank you. Such a great conversation. And I can tell in the chat, people are loving it. Oh, uh, good. So well, I feel like we could go on and on. And unfortunately, yeah. uh, unfortunately I mean, we have more events. So yes, I, hopefully there's, there's, there's so much more. Up. Yes. Um, although man, oh, Meg did um, put a question in there that yeah. I'm just gonna throw out. She said, yeah. is it address or address? Oh, this, is a, this is difficult. <laughs> I have lost all bearings being in England. I mean, my kids now sound like Peppa Pig. So I think here they don't want to say address and then address, I say address, but you know, I think it's become a, a you know, a tomato, tomato kind of thing. Right. I just don't know. <laughs> it's a great question. Man. <laughs> yes. Um, Deirdre, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank time. you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Emily. This was so much fun for me. I could talk about addresses all day, as you can probably yeah. tell. So it's lovely to have the opportunity. Thank you. Emily, yeah. Thank you for being such a wonderful moderator. Oh, it's been a, yes. an amazing thank way you. to kick off the day. So um, I hope everybody uh, is going to move on to another event, but uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap this one okay. up. Okay, so, no Emily, problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jen.